As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Then over to chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. That's God's word. All right. uh, just as we're in the break... Um, I realize uh, you come to speak to, to men uh, and you need to be aware I'm coming here uh, with an open Bible telling you about the Lord, not as an expert on how to be like the perfect man. I know the perfect man, his name is Jesus, and I'm here to show you him. And this is really important in this particular session because neither are my perfect husband. Now, I did a wedding um, uh, a couple of months ago where I was the preacher but not it wasn't at my church. I didn't know the minister. And if I get asked again to go to this church, I don't think I'll do it. Because at the end of the service, I preached the gospel. Uh, I shared about uh, how to be in a relationship with God. And it got to the end of the service, and he was summing up. And he said, now, uh, lots of you here are not married. If any of you wants to know how to be in a relationship, and I thought he was going to say, with Jesus, he didn't. He said, if you want to be in a relationship, go speak to Pastor Steve. And I was like, and I was like, hold on a minute. And he literally was telling people, if you're not married, you need to go see Steve and he'll sort you out. And I'm not. I, and I actually had one guy come to me and he's like, Steve. <laughs> and I'm not the expert on that. Uh, I'm not the expert on marriage, but we have a God who is. Okay? And that's who we're going to look at that today. Uh, so in, in my living room at home, uh, I have a painting of a place in New York City called Bryant's Park. Uh, and I've been there, and I love that park in New York. Uh, it's painted from the corner of uh, 6th Avenue and 42nd Street. And so it shows in this picture Bryant's Park, uh, the New York Public Library, and the Chrysler Building. And I love sitting in Bryant's Park reading, and I really like the Chrysler building. It's my favorite place in New York City. It's like an oasis of calm in an otherwise uh, manic place. And you can sit in the shade. You can read free books. You can play table tennis. Uh, you, you can have um, kind of mediocre coffee, but probably the best you can get in New York. And you can play uh, or watch people playing chess, which is really fun. But as I gaze at the painting in my living room, uh, I often have a longing to go back to that place. I look at it and I think, oh, I'd love to go there again. And maybe you've got pictures or paintings uh, that you look at and you think, yeah, I'd love to be back in that place. Or I'd love to go to that place. You might watch like travel programs and, and things like that and, and think, oh, I really long to go there. Uh, and what I want to put to you today is that marriage and the home is like my painting. Marriage in the home is a picture of a reality 
which is literally out of this world, that we should be able to look at and say, I want to go there. I want this to be my reality. And we'll see in the passage that that reality is Christ and the church. And so if you're here today and you're not married or you're not a father, this still is for you. Because what we're speaking of is a reality which is for you. And which you need to long for and desire more than anything else. So that's kind of the, the setup of this passage. So we're thinking about leading. Uh, we saw in the first session that we lead from our identity in Christ, which means that we will lead like Christ. And we lead like Christ when we're filled with the Spirit, which we saw in chapter 5. Uh, and these verses that follow are how to live by the Spirit. So we're looking here at a Spirit-filled home. That's kind of uh, where Paul's um, flow is going. So it's not just about being men who are married. This is for all men. Because as men, we either are married. Some of you will be preparing for marriage and will see that you're not going to wake up after your wedding day and just be the married man of God you ought to be. Um, this is for all of us. okay? But the first point I want us to look at is this word, submission. Look at verse 21. Verse 21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is for all of us. This submission here is for, for all of us. It's the first point in the passage. And to set up what it means, because it's very countercultural, um, I want us to define this word submission. So, submission, which is to each other, so this is to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, including in the home. Submission means to joyfully yield to someone else. It's to, to put yourself under them. It is renouncing your will for the sake of someone else. So here's some things that it's not. And we need to get this clear. So when we look briefly at the wife's submission, we'll know what it's not asking our wives to do or what we are not asking them to do. It is not, number one, unthinking obedience. Unthinking obedience. So whenever as Christians called to do something without thinking or understanding, so, for example, we're called to submit to the governing authorities, but not without thinking. So, we're, at the very least, we, we have to think about, is what I'm being asked to do disobeying God? In which case, then we're not to submit to that. So, it's not unthinking. Number two, it's not being walked over or abused. So, submission is never meant to be demeaning. Uh, and leadership is never, been, never meant to be free from challenge or questions. So, you're not supposed to be walked over or walk over others. Uh, number three, submission is never meant to be grudging. We're not asked to submit to one another miserably. We're not asked to submit to one another because, well, I suppose we have to, or with resentment, but rather it's a joyful thing. And then fourthly, it's not a sign of weakness or of being lesser. Submission is something that every one of us here, every Christian, is called to do in different areas of life. So, uh, you may be a husband, but you may also be an employer. Um, you may be uh, a boss at work, but then you are a member of a church and, uh, and called to submit to elders or, or whatever it might be. But all of us are called to submit to one another in various spheres of life and to do so uh, joyfully and to do so not as a sign of weakness, but actually it will, we'll see it's a sign of strength. And ultimately, uh, submission is best defined by looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, the man who is God, who is not inferior to his Father, who is fully and truly God, and yet said and lived, not my will, but yours be done. Now that's really important, because I have to say this, as, as, uh, as a pastor, I have dealt with a lot of men who, for lack of a better term, are morons when it comes to understanding what submission is. And we'll see that uh, shortly. They don't get what it is, and so it goes completely wrong in their homes. And so if I, I could leave you one thing, don't be a moron. Um, be, a, be a man of God, okay? Uh, but we're, we are, we're, we're to adopt this position of submission then all the time to one another as Christians. And so that means that there is an element of husbands submit to your wives, right? As one Christian to another, do you see? So it's not lacking leadership to submit, but rather it's to look for the needs of others. And it's basic common New Testament teaching, prefer the needs of others above yourself. And in the home, this mutual submission is important to remember. 
because there's unique roles in marriage, as we'll see, and as a, as a father and as a, as a child. Um, but we need to adopt it as mutual submission. So think of it another way in this passage. Uh, we read our husband is called to love his wife. Does that mean then that a wife doesn't need to love her husband? Well, that'd be ridiculous, right? It's just as ridiculous to say, well, then a husband never needs to be in, uh, in submission uh, to his wife. We are to, 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 to submit to her as a, as a Christian in that way. But within the home, there is a uniqueness in roles as wives and as husbands and as parents and as children, uh, which Paul draws out. So what I want us to see is that the picture that God paints is a beautiful, wonderful, glorious picture. And as uh, Michael was saying earlier, our world wants to denigrate the family and to, 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 to make it something which is ugly and horrible and uh, they demean the family. We see the tragedy of it all in our society. But what God does is he elevates the family and makes it something beautiful that we are to picture. And then for those that are not uh, part of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a marriage or your parents aren't around, um, all those kind of things, that, that picture is actually what we are to see also in the church. And we'll see that a bit later on as well. So this is it's for everyone. But let's look at the roles. And we're going to look at the role of the wife. Not because, um, I, know, I know we're at a men's conference, but we need to know what, what is Paul meaning when he talks to our wives. So look at verse 22. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So we've, we've defined what submission isn't uh, and what it is, joy, joyfully looking for the needs of, of others. But there's some important points to note here. Number one, notice who this is addressed to. This is addressed to wives. This is not addressed to husbands. And I say this for this reason. This is not a command for wives, um, or for husbands rather, to tell their wives to submit. Right? This is a command to wives to adopt a posture of submission to their husbands that helps paint the beautiful picture of what uh, Christ in the church is. All right? It's not a command to you. So don't use this to berate your wives. It's not a command to you. It doesn't say, husbands, make your wives submit. It doesn't say, husbands, read Ephesians 5.22 to her every morning. It is a, a command to wives to adopt this posture in the home to paint a picture of Christ in the church. It is not a weapon. And I say this seriously, don't you dare use it as a weapon. And I'm mad about it because I see it. I see it. Don't use this word. Don't, don't use God's word as a weapon against your wife. Don't do that. And in fact, I'll say this as well, and this is from my, my experience, so forgive me. I've, I've had a number of men come to me to talk about their wives not submitting. Do you know where the problem has lied, in my experience, 100% of the time? With the husband. I've never, ever experienced, and it, I'm not saying it's ne the wives are perfect. I'm not saying there's never a problem with wives. What I'm saying is, from my experience, in dealing with marriage difficulties, any husband that has to tell his wife to submit the problems with the husband. Okay? So it's addressed to wives. Secondly, notice that submission is to your own husband. So it's not to anyone else's, right? It's to your own husband's. So it's not saying all women are to submit to all men in this kind of a way. There's only two men a, a, a woman is to submit to, your own husband and your elder, your elders in the church. And for the elders in the church, all of you, all of us are called to submit to the elders in the church, right? So it's to your own husband, not to all men. So it, 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 this can't be used to say women can't be uh, your boss or be in government or any of those things. So what is the wife commanded to do? She's called to submit in the home to her husband's leadership and to help him carry out his leadership in a Christ-like way. This is not demeaning but fulfilling the role of helper that God gave Eve, the first wife in creation. And similarly, the Holy Spirit is called the helper, isn't he? So it's not a demeaning role. This is not saying that, um, uh, it, Paul says, by the way, as you do to the Lord. Notice that there? As you do to the Lord. It's not saying the husband is the Lord, but it's saying that submitting to the husband is part of your submission to the Lord. That's the meaning. 
So in verse 23, Paul gives the reason why a wife is to, is to submit to her husband. He says, for, so this is the reason, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. So notice, it's a picture. That picture's uh, shown uh, towards the end of chapter 5. The wife's submission is there to show the world what the relationship between Christ and the church is like. That's the purpose. It's not her being inferior. It's to, it's to show the, 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 the submission of the church to the Savior, Jesus. So when we read here of Christ being Savior, by the way, it does not mean that we're the Savior of the wife or anything like that. Rather, we see, that, see here that the headship of Christ is one of self-sacrifice seen on the cross in the way that he saved us. So, so, so a wife is not really, well, in fact, not even not really, a wife is not called to submit to some abusive man who happens to be a husband. She's called to submit to him like Christ, her saviour. So if you're, as a husband, and we'll see, if you're not acting like Christ the saviour, then the problem lies with you, not with her. And the church, God's people, submit to Christ. And so if this picture is going to work, then the wife must submit to her husband, which we read in verse 24 is in everything. In everything means in every sphere of life, not in everything he says. So in every, everything does not include disobeying God. So this is not some old-fashioned unjust command. This is our loving creator showing us how we are made to be. So remember, when Paul talked about putting on new, the new self in chapter 4, verse 24, it was created or tailor-made. That's how we're meant to be. And for us, whether we're married or unmarried, we're, well, we're not, I was going to say if we're men or women, but we're all men here. <laughs> um, the, 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 that's the posture we're to take to Jesus and to, in fact, to all authority that God has put over us. So that's part of the picture. So does that make sense? That's, that's to the wives. Let's look at the husband. So the wife is called to submit to her own husband, but the husband also has a calling. Now, you might think after calling the wife to submission, the next uh, phrase should be, husbands, rule your wives. You might think that's what Paul might say. But look at what Paul says. Read the verse. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So, Number one, we've seen a, a, a wife as a posture of submission. Number two, husbands, a Christ-like love. A Christ-like love. That's the second, the second point. So a posture of submission, and then number two, a Christ-like love. How does Jesus love his church? Paul says that Jesus gave himself for her. Jesus provided for his people's greatest need, didn't he? He provided for the forgiveness of sins. By dying on the cross, he gave his life for the church. He was a servant of the church. And a husband is to love like that. Like that. So can you see that this is not um, barking orders from the couch? You know, like, make me a sandwich. Or something like that. This is a servant who is willing to die to himself. For the love of his wife. So in, apply, in applying this, I want to help um, see what this means. When it says here that Christ gave himself for the church, and we are to give ourselves for our wives, we're thinking about dying, aren't we? Dying to self. Now, there is an element of truth that if a bus was going to come and, and like hit your wife, it would be right for you to jump in front of the bus and push her out of the way. But let's be honest. I would do that for my wife, but I'd, I'd do that for your wife, right? I would I'd do that for you, I'd like to think. I mean, I'd like to think. I mean, I've never, it's not happened, but I'd like to think, right? In my, that I think that's easy, to be honest. If it was a case of life or death, me or her, I don't think it's that hard. For her husband to love his wife by saving her life. And so when Paul calls us to give ourselves here, I kind of, I'd rather you get that image out of your head because that's easy. What is harder is to do the little, little deaths day by day to self 
that love your wife. I find it harder to get off my backside and help with the children, or do the dishes, or make her a, a coffee, or run her a bath, or watch the film that she wants to see. I mean, I know she's been talking about watching Pride and Prejudice again. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is very real for me. Five, the five hour, the five hour, the five hour one, right? It's not being recorded, is it? So, <laughs> all right. So um, I've got to watch it now. Um, but, it, but, it, but in seriousness, th those things are harder than jumping in front of the bus. They are. Those are the things that we're called to die to. Those are the things we're called to die to. To die to ourselves in little ways, day by day, that love our wives, that love them. But another little caveat, this is not just about making your wives happy. That can actually be sinful. Uh, there are many of us that probably would do even watch Pride and Prejudice for a quiet life, right? Um, many ways to, um, it, it, you, know, you can do nice things in order to shut people up. You can do that, and that's not what this means. This is about providing for what your wife needs. And that means being concerned for her own spiritual life, which is like Jesus is with us. So notice verse 26, Paul says that Christ gave himself to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. Why did Jesus die for us? Yes, to pay the penalty for our sin. But he died for us also to make us holy. That is to make us look like himself, pure and set apart for the glory of God. That's why Jesus died for us, to make us a new man. His death provided cleansing from sin. And that's what the cleansing here means. So when it says, with water through the word, it means that Jesus reveals himself through his word, preached, and that is what is in, that what's, that's what enables us to be cleansed, which is what water baptism and pictures. So Christ's goal for us is to be holy, to be cleansed. And so, therefore, I take this to mean that as a husband, we're to be concerned for the holiness of our wives. That is, to see our leadership role as leading her to Jesus, which is the greatest need that she has. So I said about providing for her needs. Your wife's greatest need is the same as your greatest need. It's to be like Christ. That's, after all, what Jesus does for us. He's concerned about our holiness. He makes us holy. So how do we lead our wives in this way? Well, can I suggest you be like Jesus? Lead like he does. By showing in your life and by telling in your words. Jesus showed us who he is, showed us God, and he told us God. And he left us with a record of it in the Bible, didn't he? So for husbands, this means that you need to speak to your wife about Christian things. You need to take an interest in her spiritual growth. I mean, do you ever... Speak to your wife about the things of the Lord. Do you ever share with her the things that you're learning? Do you ever read the Bible with her and pray with her? I, can I encourage you to do that? Take the lead in doing that. Take the lead in going to church. Go to church morning and evening. Take your wife, take your children. And if for, for various reasons children can't come to a service, let your wife come. I remember um, when we, we first had children, they were very small. Uh, I remember the midweek prayer meeting. Uh, there was a period of time where I was going to the prayer meeting so I didn't have to put my kids to bed. I'll be honest with you, that's what I was doing that. I found it way easier to go and pray than to put the children to bed. And the Lord really convicted me on that. And so I went home and we talked to my wife about it. We, we, we then started taking it in turns to go, uh, to, get to, the, to get to the prayer meeting. Um, and again... Take the lead in that. Make sure that she's being fed spiritually in, in those kinds of, of ways. But primarily, it means being a man yourself who is captivated by Christ. And again, we said in the first session, what comes out of our mouth, it, it, it shows what's in our hearts. And if Christ is in your heart, then you are going to speak of Christ in your home as well, aren't you? One writer uh, helpfully says this, which is a real challenge. 
When we men read verses 25 to 27 together, we cannot escape our huge responsibility. Is our wife more like Christ because she is married to us? Or is she like Christ in spite of us? Whatever our effect, our call is clear, sanctifying love. It's a challenge, isn't it? Well, in verse 28, Paul says, in the same way, or just like Jesus, husbands are to love their wives like their own bodies. So Paul begins to explain a motivation for loving your wife in this way. It loves yourself. Did you know it's it's kind of an act of self-harm to not love your wife, isn't it? Uh, Unless something's seriously wrong, you take care of your own body, don't you? Uh, You feed it, you care for it, uh, you you wash it, um, hopefully. (laughs) Uh, You brush your teeth, you exercise, all those kinds of things. But Jesus, though, does not just think of his own body. He cares for the church as his own body. He provides for it, he cares for it. And in verse 30, Jesus does that because we are members of his body. And so a husband treats his wife in such a way that it cares for his own body as well. It is self-harm not to love your wife. So care for them. Nurture your wives like your own bodies. And that means we need to stop just thinking of ourselves, isn't it? Love your wife like Christ loves the church. That means you need to be enabling your wife to fulfill her God-given role in the home, in the church, in the world, You need to be enabling and caring for the flourishing of your wife. You need to, you know, really desire that she, for Christ, flourishes. So in in applying this, I don't think we need to only speak to husbands, though. Uh, I I say to you young men who who are not married, be this man now. How? Give yourself to others. Give yourselves to others. Serve in the church. Take responsibility in the church. We'll see that in the the final session. But love women in this way in the church. You know, don't just, don't don't examine their bodies, but serve them. Pray for them. Be concerned for their spiritual welfare. If you're living at home, can I suggest you, you love your parents in this way? Be concerned to serve them. And want them to flourish and thrive in the home. And let me say this to the, to the unmarried men. I don't know if there are many of you here. Um, I don't know any of you really. But I, I just want to tell you this. You are, not, you are not going to wake up the day after your wedding and all of a sudden be the Christ-like husband. There is no kind of in the wedding ceremony some like husband dust <laughs> that's sprinkled on you that all of a sudden you wake up the next day and now you're the man of God. No, be the man now. And if I was here speaking to women, which obviously I'm not, I would say to them, look for this kind of man now. So be the kind of man that a woman, would, a Christian woman would want to marry. And you be that kind of man by being the kind of man who loves the women in the church in a Christ-like way. And for all of us, let's thank God that Jesus does love us like this, right? You are loved by the perfect man, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given himself for you and has made you holy so that you will be presented before God without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. And that's really important today because I don't want you to feel crushed by all of this. You are a work in progress along with me, a work in progress where Jesus is working on us to make us presentable before God. And that's that's good news. So it's all very countercultural, but it's biblical, isn't it? And the, the, the spirit-filled marriage is a real witness to our world. Look at the picture in, uh, at the end of chapter 5. It says, um, uh, where am I? Yeah, verse, <laughs> verse 32, this is a profound mystery. A mystery, by the way, is uh, a picture um, that has been hidden but is now revealed. He says, the, the mystery for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's the, the mystery I'm talking about, Christ and the church. So Paul quotes Galatians 2.24, where God instituted marriage. And let me just define marriage for you so you know what it is in this day. It is one man with one woman creating a family unit 
and is the context for sexual one flesh relationship. It is for life and it is till death. That's how God designed marriage to be. Anything else is not marriage. Whatever the world says it is, it is not marriage. And in Genesis, the reason a man leaves his father and mother is to create a new family. And the mystery is that it paints the picture of Christ and the church. It is meant to be a living drama of Jesus and his people. That's the purpose of marriage. Um, so since we're talking about the home, uh, I'm going to move on as well to, to chapter 6. Okay, to chapter 6, uh, where we, we see children uh, and parents. And this also, I think, is part of this painting uh, of what's going on here. Uh, so thirdly then, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, children, obey your parents. Now, looking around um, the, the group here, there, there are no, uh, no boys, um, but it's worth uh, speaking about children uh, because as, uh, we need to know this as parents. What is God expecting of our children? Well, we need to learn as men that children learn through example. Okay, they learn through example. Uh, even a bad example will show us what is not right. Uh, some of you here would have had bad examples of being a father. Uh, you can learn through that too. Um, that's not to say it's okay to be bad. I'm, don't take that at all. But what I'm saying is children do learn through example. And they also learn through obedience to parents. Uh, because it's through obedience to parents that we learn obedience to God. And obedience to God is where as men we lead, we lead from, isn't it? So we live in a, a child-centered culture. What I mean is that children are often the, often the center of the world. They get what they want. It's especially true, I think, when it comes to screens. I see this all the time. Uh, children are shut up. They are made placid. They are not trained by being handed an iPad to watch all day. Okay, that's not training children. Children need to learn obedience and be trained in following the Lord. So, um, brothers, we, we need to be, to be, to, to expect children to obey. Um, it's an expectation we should have. We shouldn't just think it's okay to let them do what they want. Um, we should expect them to obey. And there's two reasons Paul gives for children obeying. First of all, it is right. So in other words, uh, that means it, it's natural. It's the natural order of things. In our world, we see children making demands of parents, throwing tantrums, uh, disrespecting them. Uh, and that happens in, in, in Christian homes uh, as well. But the difference in a Christian home is we, we should know that is not right. It's not right. The way the world is made is not for parents to obey children, but for children to obey parents, you see. Secondly, it's for our good. So the command is part of the Ten Commandments. Notice there in verse three, uh, at the end of verse 2, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, it doesn't mean if you obey your parents, you're never going to get sick. You'll always be prosperous, uh, those kinds of things. But just as a, a general rule in life, a bit like the book of Proverbs, they're not, they're not like rules that always will come to pass. But as a general rule in life, things will go better you obey your parents and even as, as men things will go better if you seek to honor and please your parents okay so i mean you see the the, the hassle and the destruction in society when parents are disobeyed and dishonored and we continue that into adulthood uh, as men we don't obey parents but we do honor them care for your parents visit your parents seek to please your parents life is better this way and then finally, um, so we've looked at wives, husbands, children, and then fathers, chapter 6, verse 4. Look at chapter 6, verse 4. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, fathers are singled out here because they are the ones who are held responsible by the Lord for leading in the home. And this includes the raising of children. Now, again, I think um, as Christians in the church, I think we see child rearing as like a woman thing too much. Um, and one way we see this, at least like the, one way I see this, is how many men are Sunday school teachers in our churches? I would say not many. I struggle to find men to teach Sunday school. And in a culture of much fatherlessness, we need more men teaching Sunday school. And let me encourage you, men, if, you, if that's something you feel you're able to do, 
and your elders feel that's something you could do, it's an excellent ministry to get involved in in teaching the children Sunday school. That's a bit of an aside, but um, but raising children is not a woman thing. It is a husband and wife thing, of which God holds you, husband and father, responsible for. It's not down to your wife to do all this. You set the tone. You direct. And so there are two aspects of this, one negative and one positive. On the negative, don't exasperate or or provoke to anger. So that's the negative. Don't exasperate or provoke to anger. Now, this doesn't mean don't upset your kids ever. Um, It it doesn't mean that you can never discipline them in a way that they'll get annoyed with. All right. If they're not kind of upset, then you're probably not disciplining them. Um, But it does mean don't do so in such a way that gives them a right to be angry with you. So your your child might get angry with you, but don't give them a right to be angry with you. Don't act in such a way where the Lord thinks, yeah, that's probably righteous anger. So there are a number of ways we can do this. You can be too harsh. That's one. So that can be by in punishing them really severely in comparison to what they have done. Just as a bit of a warning on this, you can only punish so far. So let me urge you to, to save serious punishments for serious demeanors because if you've used up all your all your kind of ammunition you've got nowhere else to go when they do something really bad right and they probably will um but you can also be harsh in, in getting at them for everything for every little thing um what i mean by this is that, uh, getting at them for stuff that's not necessarily sin but stuff that you just don't like i remember like one time i was telling one of my children off because they're being really just loud right they're being loud upstairs and I was trying to do something downstairs. Do you know what they were doing? They were singing worship songs. <laughs> and I'm like, will you keep it down? And then like, I'm like, hold on a minute, they're singing God's praises, right? <laughs> How ridiculous is that? Um, that's an example of being, I, I, I was definitely too harsh. I should be like, thank God, they're singing the praises of Jesus, right? So pick your battles. You know, if, they, if your child wants to wear something like, that you don't like, let them wear it. You know, Bristol Rover shirt, wherever you are. You know, you have to just, it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it's okay. It's okay. So don't, don't be too harsh. Pick, pick, pick your battles. And um, on the other hand, you can be too lenient. So when children can get away with anything. And that exasperates them because one day, I, I can tell you this from, from my own experience um, growing up, where really we could do whatever we want. Uh, your children will resent you if you just let them do what they want. They, they will. Um, the, the sin, that, that it, that the consequences that those sins that they are committing reaps are such that they will not thank you for not disciplining them. They won't. Um, in fact, my wife, um, she, her, her, she had a, a childhood where her, her mum died and her dad um, was abusive. She had to, he had, she had, they had to flee him. And she lived with her two brothers. Her oldest brother was just 18, and she had a younger brother. And they had no discipline whatsoever. It was a disaster for her. And she moved in. She was adopted by a Christian family who, who enacted discipline. And she says in her testimony, I loved that discipline. I needed those boundaries. She loved it. They're not going to hate you for, for, for showing them what's right, okay? Uh, so that's the second. There's a few more. Um, you can exasperate them by contradicting their mother and confuse them. Uh, so be together with your wife. And if you disagree, speak to your wife privately. Don't have an argument in front of the children about how you're disciplining the children. Be a united front. Uh, then also you can lack respect or authority yourself. Don't tell your children to obey you when you're always complaining about the authority in your life. Don't complain about your boss. Don't criticize the elders or the preachers at church. Don't disobey the traffic laws or or moan about the government in such a way that is really disrespectful and then be telling them what to do because they will feed off of your disrespect for authority. Uh, Also, you could lack um, integrity. Don't live by the rule of do what I say, not what I do. That's a ridiculous thing for a Christian to say. Be the kind of person that you want your children to be. Model Christ to them. Have integrity. And then the final thing, just... Um, that I've got to say on this particular not exasperating them on the negative side um, you exasperate them when you don't admit when you're wrong apologize to your children because you will screw up you will because you're a human being who is a sinner 
And when you do, go to them and say, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. It's really important you do that. I mean, how are they going to see um, repentance and what that means if they don't see that in you first, right? So that's the negative side. On the positive side, Paul says, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, the, the Greek word there for bring them up is, is a word which means to nourish or feed. And so we are to feed them God's word and help them to live it out. So that means opening up your Bible with your children. It can sound daunting to do that, but it's not talking here necessarily of an in-depth Bible study. When they're young, read them stories from the Bible. As they get older, read passages or books with them that try to answer their questions. When you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. Then go find out and you'll learn and grow as a man yourself. And then go tell them, yeah, I've studied this. Or even say to them, why don't we look at this together and try and work it out? Because I really don't know. Don't worry about looking like an idiot because you probably are, right? So like, that's, we are. We're not perfect men. We, we don't know stuff. And it's okay for our kids to see that. But let them see you then desiring to seek out Christ and, and what the truth is. Require obedience of them. That's another way of bringing them up. Require it. Ensure they obey quickly. Ensure they obey uh, with a good attitude um, and all those kinds of things. And discipline, in, discipline them in that regard. Discipline doesn't just mean giving them a clip around the ear. Discipline is training, isn't it? And they'll thank you for it. Um, how you discipline uh, depends on your child. People respond in, in different ways to different things. Um, I, you know, my... When I was growing up, I got two sisters. Me and one sister loved going out, so grounding was good. But my other sister, if you grounded her, she'd love it. It's like, great, I can have quite happy to sit in my room. So work out what works uh, for your own children. But here is the thing. Make sure that they are being nourished in the word. Because if you don't nourish them, the world will. There's a writer, uh, a Puritan, John Flavel. And listen to these challenging words. If you neglect to instruct your children in the, way of the holy, in the way of holiness, will the devil neglect to instruct them in the way of wickedness? If you neglect to instruct your children in the way of holiness, will the devil neglect to instruct them in the way of wickedness? No, the devil won't. Let's not make it easy for the devil by making our children have to find the way of holiness on their own. And can I just give one word of challenge to the fathers among us? In this day that we live, you need to be careful and strict with your children's phones. Uh, I work closely with this as a governor at a local primary school. Uh, in my primary school, um, it's, a, it's an area, uh, the, the phones is an area of life which is a disaster for the children in the school I'm a governor of, an absolute catastrophe. Um, the impact that social media, and TikTok and pornography, yes, the children is having is horrendous. And if you are not careful with your children's use of phones, they will be nourished by them. And so I encourage you, in fact, I urge you, set time limits, have blocks, um, and, and some advice not from the Bible, but from me. If they're not a secondary school, if they're not a secondary school, just don't give them a phone. Um, just don't do it. Um, I'm not saying if they're at secondary school, you must. What I'm saying is, at the very least, in primary school, they don't need it. I promise you. At the same time, men, be careful how you use yours. Is the image that your child has of you as a father, of you sat with your phone scrolling, or sat with your Bible open sharing? Think about that. They will learn how to use their phone also from you. So make sure you're using it wisely yourself. May the image of you as a father be one with Bible in hand, showing in Christ. I want to just close with um, something I want you to imagine. It should be hard because I'm going to say imagine you come to my house, which is hard because I live far away. But imagine if you're in my living room, and you see that picture of, of Bryant's Park. And you said, that's a really lovely picture. Because it is. It's a, it's a good painting. Uh, and you said, oh, Steve, that looks amazing. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Here's, here's two tickets. Let's go. I'll take you there. 
we can go to, to, to Bryant's Park, New York. You wouldn't say, ah, oh, um, nah, I'd, I'd rather just look at the painting, thanks. You'd be foolish, wouldn't you, to do that? But it, you'd be just as foolish to, to look at a passage like this and just say, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, what a lovely, lovely picture. But miss the reality of what is being painted. Yes, we need to be painting this picture in our homes, but the picture we're painting is of eternal life in heaven through a relationship with God. Our homes display Jesus to the world as we live like Jesus in the world. It displays Jesus as you paint the picture he is showing you here. He left the glory of heaven and he served. Looking out for the interests of others, he showed true love. And the secret to leading in the home is to follow the pattern that Jesus has set us here. Look out for the needs of others, in self-denial. And that's not just the way to a blessed home. It's actually the way to true joy. So men, show Jesus to the world in how you lead in your home. Let all see that you are a forgiven man who loves Jesus. And because of this, you love one another too. And as you do that, may it give you a longing for more of Christ, for more of Jesus. And so that means if you're, if you're here and you're, you're not married yet, and you're not a father yet, as you look at other marriages and you see a passage like this, may it make you long for more of Christ, and to be like him. And that is the way to true and lasting life. So again, let me, let me pray.